Good evening, everyone. Dan Henry here in the Full Warren Weather Center alongside Ali Turiano, making me look old. Uh, <laughs> but uh, <Yeah. laughs> um, we're going to try to cover as many bases as uh, we can tonight. We're not only going to discuss uh, tomorrow's setup for a severe weather here in North Texas and at least what we think may unfold at this point in time, but uh, we, we figured that now is a good time as well, March the 1st, kind of being the start, unofficial start of spring, to uh, talk about uh, severe weather safety, uh, to talk about some of the terms that you may hear us uh, throw around on the air quite a bit, um, and uh, to, to just to help kind of guide you through, steer you through so that uh, you can stay safe for this severe weather season. Exactly. So I've got our Facebook Live up right now on my phone. So as folks are joining us and asking questions, we'll try and get through as much as we can. And just we're going to go through graphics and discuss some things first. So if you can hold off on the questions, at least in the beginning for a little bit, and then we'll be able to answer as uh, much as we can. If you've ever joined us at Nebraska Furniture Mart for our severe weather uh, segment there that we do once a year, we typically do that in April. April. Uh, so a lot of this, if you've been to one of those before, a lot of this you may already know, but uh, any question we look forward to answering uh, and getting folks ready. And it just so happens, you know, with tomorrow's severe weather event, that this is perfect timing. Yeah. I mean, we planned this uh, a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. And so it just so happens that, you know, that it's going to be, you know, on the eve of what could be a potential severe weather outbreak here. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and start our presentation here. Um, and we're going to begin with a watch versus a warning. Now, more than likely, uh, we will be under a watch tomorrow. Uh, it will most likely be a tornado watch. When a watch is issued, that means that conditions are favorable for the development of severe weather. It's uh, often issued up to six hours in advance of seeing any severe weather. Now, once a warning is issued, that means that uh, severe weather is either occurring right now or is imminent. It's expected uh, within, you know, literally minutes uh, ahead of time. And that's the whole goal here. The National Weather Service over the decades has improved their warnings. I think the average lead time now for a tornado warning is about 14 to 16 minutes in advance. Um, we, we, they strive to do that. We don't issue the warnings. The National Weather Service issues the warnings. The watches, by the way, are issued by the Storm Prediction Center up in Norman, Oklahoma. Now, a lot of times people can get watches and warnings confused, and I had to add this. I, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you've seen this on social media, whether it's with cake making, but, you know, come on, come on. We're in North <laughs> Texas. We all love tacos. So a watch means the ingredients are there to make that taco, to potentially have severe weather. A warning means, yeah, tacos are here, folks. We're about to, to have the tacos. So uh, that's a, a great way to kind of understand what's the difference between watch and warning in a, in a funny way, but also a little bit easier to remember, I think, than uh, than us talking about watches and warnings. You're making me hungry now. Uh, <laughs> so, all right, some tornado terminology. We've discussed watch and warning. What do you do when a watch? Well, you know, you really need to be thinking about where you would go, your tornado safe shelter, um, how you're going to get there. Don't wait until the warning is issued to all of a sudden start having to think about your plan already have a plan in mind so that when that warning is issued, you can take action immediately. Now, aside from a watch and a warning, a very occasionally, you will see something called a tornado emergency issue. That is under very special circumstances when the National Weather Service deems there is a significant threat to life and property um, when, when we've got especially a confirmed tornado on the ground you know, heading towards a highly populated area, they will issue a tornado emergency, just to, a heightened alert to really get the attention attention of people to take action. Yeah, um, this next one, I, we, we talk about this a lot, our severe risk category. So again, it's the Storm Prediction Center that puts this out for us and we then relay that information. What I've highlighted are levels three and level four. So that's enhanced and moderate. You hear us talk about that on a scale of one to five, we're at a three in parts of North Texas. And then tomorrow as well, we're in that moderate level four. So what does that actually mean? I think it could be very confusing because there's just so much information 
that is kind of coming at you at once. So for us, you know, on a regular day, we can have a marginal risk for a severe thunderstorm. We had that this morning. So typically that means isolated, short-lived event, uh, not necessarily everyone dealing with that in North Texas. Now, tomorrow, we're looking at that 3-4, which is very pretty high on the, on the scale. And we don't necessarily have a lot of moderate outlooks. Yeah, you, you really see a very North. small handful of moderate risk days uh, uh, issued here in, in North Texas. And, uh, you know, the way to think about it, too, is you can have a tornado on a marginal risk day. Um, like you can an enhanced or a moderate day. But what we anticipate is there to be more widespread severe weather when you've got an enhanced or a moderate risk issued for an area. So uh, one of the big concerns tomorrow is we're going to see, in all likelihood, a very strong line of severe thunderstorms develop out to our west. That will likely take place around 3 to 4 o'clock in the afternoon and march eastward. So it's going to affect uh, probably 90% of the area. And, and with that in mind, there are going to be numerous reports of severe weather as that line moves through. Now, ahead of that line, in the noon to, let's say, 3 o'clock time period, we will also have to be very vigilant watching radar for what we call these discrete storms, these isolated storms that will develop in advance of the line of storms. Um, if, if they become supercells, rotating severe thunderstorms, they'll be capable of producing all modes of severe weather, including large hail, damaging winds, and tornadoes. So there's our severe weather risk graphic. This is for tomorrow afternoon and tomorrow evening. Moderate risk in red from roughly eastern Dallas County uh, through our eastern and northeastern counties. And then we've got the enhanced risk there in orange. That includes the remainder of the Metroplex. And finally, far western counties under a slight risk for tomorrow afternoon and tomorrow evening. Uh, that said, we want everyone to be weather aware tomorrow. So don't just, you know, say, oh, I live, you know, well west of Fort Worth. I'm only in the slight risk, so I don't have to pay attention. We don't want you to read into the graphic like yeah, that. Yeah, and I think that's what happens <clears throat> often is that people see marginal or slight and think, oh, I don't have to worry about severe weather. But it all that means is that there's just less of a likelihood we have widespread severe weather. Even on those marginal and slight risk days, we can often have at least a few severe thunderstorms. It's just more likely to see more widespread storms in that enhanced and moderate risk. Uh, so that's the graphic we show on air. This is also one that we like to show on air as well. Yeah, and this can be a little bit confusing because people look at the right-hand column and they say, oh, we're going to get, you know, egg-sized hail where I live tomorrow, 75 mile an hour wind gusts, uh, a tornado. Uh, again, what I like to call these, these events is they are high impact, but low probability events, meaning that uh, if you look at a particular point in North Texas, your home, that's a very, very small target. And so the odds are always going to be on your side. Chances are you probably won't get hit by that high end weather exactly where you live. Um, so what we've done here is we've kind of broken it down further. These are roughly the chances of seeing severe weather or any weather for that matter in the county, the county that you live in. Um, a 90% chance tomorrow that rain's going to fall on your head. Very strong likelihood. But when you look at the high wind gusts, 60 miles an hour or greater, now we cut that in half. But again, that's for your county. So let's say you live in Collin County. Somewhere in Collin County, we expect there to be a 45% chance that there's going to be a 60 mile an hour wind gust or higher. Is it going to be McKinney? Is it going to be Salina? Is it going to be Plano? Is it going to be Farmersville? We don't know. We're, we're not at that stage of the science yet where we can, we can pinpoint exactly where the severe weather is going to hit. We can just tell you that conditions across the entire area are favorable for it to develop. Where exactly it happens, it'd be like kind of putting you know, the old-fashioned popcorn. You put you know a couple hundred kernels in the pot. You tell me which 10 or 20 are going to pop first. It's almost impossible to tell. They're all in that hot pot with, with the oil there, uh, but determining which ones are going to pop and which ones may not at all is, is really an impossible task, at least at this point in time, with our understanding of the science. Yeah, and so going on, you know, when we talk about 
your wind threat, then we take it to the hail threat, and again, that's 30%. Uh, so it is, that is, on, in the grand it's scheme of things, that's yeah. significant, up to egg size, so that's a little bit larger than golf ball, and we'll talk about hail size here coming up in a bit. And then our tornado threat, you know, you often, when we show this graphic on air, you'll often see your 2 or 5% here for us, but this is pretty significant here as well, 10%. Metroplex uh, westward and then 15% to the east of the Metroplex. So while in the grand scheme of things, that's still low, uh, but that is relatively a number you don't see us often have forecasted here. Yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty significant when it comes to uh, a severe weather potential. All right, so the most active period of weather. Now, uh, notice the, the yellow text at the top left there. The timing of the squall line is what this, this timing references here. We expect that line of strong and severe storms to develop probably right around 3 o'clock in the afternoon in our far western counties and then march eastward, likely reaching the uh, I-35 corridor, the Metroplex. Unfortunately, that coincides right with rush hour. 5 p.m. to maybe as late as 9 p.m., although I think most of the Dallas-Fort Worth area may be on the back side of it uh, after 8 o'clock, and then 7 to 10 p.m. for our eastern counties. Again, that's for the line of storms that's more than likely going to produce the bulk of our severe weather tomorrow. Ahead of that, before this line even develops, we will be watching the radar very closely from roughly around noon through 3 o'clock in the afternoon for the potential of isolated severe storms developing. And if those become supercells, um, they'll likely move very quickly from south to north across the area and would be capable of all modes of severe weather as well. Yeah, and that's one thing to note about tomorrow. These are going to be fast movers. The individual cells that Dan talked about earlier in the afternoon, but also this line of storms as well, uh, will be moving quickly from west to east through the late afternoon and evening. Now, uh, Dan, this is something that I've actually talked to a lot of viewers about lately, and someone did ask, uh, they, they have a lot of storm anxiety. So how can you get yourself to re remain calm in these types of situations. I'm all about knowledge is power. So staying, knowing the forecast, having more than one way to get weather alerts, whether it's you know through social media or a, a radar app, the WAP will give you those severe weather alerts, watching us, but also having that emergency plan in place is so important. We get severe weather here all year round, but it's typically more common now as we go through the spring months. So uh, folks have been asking, okay, well, what do I do in my home? I live in a mobile home. What if I'm outside? What are some things that they can do? Yeah, so, I mean, obviously we know there's a significant uh, part of the population that, uh, that lives in mobile homes. Um, and what I would tell people first and foremost, you have to be especially vigilant, in, especially on days like tomorrow. So the best thing that you can do is find a friend, or a family member that lives in a in a well constructed home and stay there for the afternoon or the evening. I realize it's an inconvenience, um, but but that is my 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 best advice to give somebody that lives in a mobile home. If that's for whatever reason not a possibility, then I would ask myself: Does the mobile home park that I live in have a designated shelter? Yeah. Some do, some don't. If it does then Perfect. you go there. Um, if there's no other uh, home to go to, be it a, friend, a family member or a, a friend, um, then pack up your things and, and maybe, you know, uh, spend, you know, the day at, uh, you know, somewhere like a mall maybe. Um, and, 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 you know, ride out the storms in, in a safe shelter uh, because a mobile home does not afford you, uh, in many cases, uh, safety during these very high wind events and, and during tornado events. Um, it is not, not advisable at all if you're in your mobile home and you're still there and the warnings issued and the winds are picking up and the rain is falling outside to pack up and get in a car. No. And at that point in time, if you're in that situation, then you really have no choice but to batten down the hatches and stay where you are. I would never advise anybody when the weather's starting to hit, 
that that's in that type of situation to leave and get in a vehicle because you're going to be even more vulnerable uh, getting outside in the elements, getting in a car and trying to drive somewhere in those type of situations. But the goal is to have the knowledge and understanding that this is in the forecast. Uh, technology today is amazing. These things, little handheld computers, and you can have radar on your phone with the WAP or any other app that you would like to use. And so you can actually, you'll be able to track these storms with us tomorrow. So if a supercell develops at 1230 and say Itasca in, you know, in our Southern zones, we know that that thing is going to be racing from south to north. So if you're in Dallas and you can see that and, you know, we're tracking it out and you can see, okay, I have an hour to figure out what I'm going to do. Uh, that's, you know, the knowledge is power. Then you know that, okay, well, I already have a plan in place. I know where I'm going and you don't have to worry about that. You already have things ready to go. Um, when you are in a regular, just good old fashioned house, we talk about the lowest level of your home inside away from windows and doors but sometimes the bathroom can have a window yeah yeah the idea here is you want to put as many walls between you and what may be blowing outside as possible so if you're in a multi-level home you want to be in the lowest floor available uh either a bathroom or a closet maybe it's a pantry for you Every single home is different. The layout is different. So for some, the safest place, the interior place, may be a closet. For others, it may be a bathroom. A bathroom is often a good place as well because you've got plumbing in the walls. It helps to reinforce those walls as well. You can get in a bathtub. You can put a mattress or blankets over top of your head for, 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 uh, for protection. Um, I remember, quick story here, back when I worked in, in Raleigh in the 1990s, I went out, surveyed some damage. Uh, there was an older woman in her mid to late 70s. Her home was devastated. Uh, most of the exterior walls had collapsed. She had lost her roof. There was broken glass. Her chimney collapsed. And she did not have a scratch on her. And I asked her, I said, ma'am, were you in the house when this tornado hit? She says, yes, I was. She says, where were you? She says, I was in my bedroom closet. We went to that bedroom closet, opened up the door, and the clothing was still hung on the hangers. It wasn't even displaced a bit. The shoes and her shoe boxes were all neatly piled. And so that just goes to show you that in, mo in the vast majority of tornadoes, if you're in a well-built home and, and you go to your safe shelter like that, um, you're going to be just fine. Now, many po folks also live in apartment complexes. Yep. Maybe you're Ryan up on actually the, asked about that. You're up on the fourth or fifth floor. It's still it's advisable to try to get down to that lowest level there. So get to know some of your neighbors that yeah. live on that lowest floor and see if you can ride it out at their place. If that's not an option, if you're on the exterior, let's say of the building, maybe you've got an interior uh, stairwell that you can get into um, that's sheltered from, from the elements. Yep. Maybe there's a garage, a parking garage in the basement, um, you know, even better. Uh, as long as it's below ground level there, then that's that would be a, a yeah. really good option for Folks you. Folks have been asking about their fur babies, and I'll tell you, with all of my cats, we have hard uh, travel carriers. The cats go in the carrier with my husband in the bathroom while I'm at work if we're under a tornado warning. So it, he literally knows that's what needs to be done. And we have several carriers for all of our animals because often you hear people losing their cats or their dog ran, you know, and they can't find them through the rubble. If they're in that carrier, they're protected just like you. If you, you know, when you, if you put up a bike helmet on your kids, if you have blankets over you to help protect you, the animals will then be protected as yeah, well. Yeah, I like to think worst case scenario there too. So, you know, yeah. why not keep your, your bicycle helmets in that closet for extra head protection? Make sure you're wearing not slippers, not bedroom slippers, but shoes, shoes. with hard soles on them in case you are hit. Many times people suffer injuries uh, they're safe in the storm itself, and then they go outside, and all of a sudden, they you know, there's there's debris, there's broken glass, glass yeah. there's brick, um, and nails, and and people end up hurting themselves um, because they don't have regular shoes on. So make sure that that you've got you know good shoes on your feet. 
um, and and also a flashlight. Make sure there's a flashlight in there as well in case you lose power. Uh, you've got a source of light. Yeah, and you know having an emergency preparedness kit works all year round. Whether it's winter weather here and you don't have power for a few first days, first aid kit in there, a first aid kit, medications, important yep. documents. Having all that in one place and knowing where that is is so important before we go into any type of weather event here. So um, are you storm ready? We, we talked about a few of these things. Yeah. So first question you need to ask yourself is, will my home provide a good location to take shelter? Uh, if the answer is no, then you have to ask yourself, is there a neighbor, a friend or family member that I can go to whose house is close by? If the answer to that question is no, then you need to find a nearby storm shelter that is open. The day that the severe weather is hitting is not the time to find out the answers to these questions. You should know the answers to these questions right now. You should know that if you've got nowhere to go, where is the closest available storm shelter to where I live? And if you don't know that, you need to find out as quickly as possible. Yeah. Now, we have storm chasers here at Fox 4, but a lot of folks will send us in pictures and video. We obviously love getting that when you're safely doing that. But you know, it can be a little confusing what is what when you're looking in the sky. Yeah, so this is what's called a shelf cloud. Now a shelf cloud forms along the leading edge of thunderstorm cooled air. As that cool air propagates outward, it undercuts the very warm, humid air and you get this low hanging shelf cloud. Typically, you'll see winds, you know, on the order of about to 30, 40, maybe sometimes up to 50 miles an hour. So a shelf cloud, uh, generally speaking, does not signal uh, that we're going to get severe gusts of wind. They're usually below severe levels. It's pretty ominous looking. It can frighten the daylights out of you, but um, that's makes basically... Makes for great pictures. It for does sure. make for, for a great photo. All right, so now this is a wall cloud. So wall clouds come in all different shapes and sizes, but the definition of a wall cloud, it's the isolated lowering, the rain-free base uh, of a severe thunderstorm. There's a lot of action that's taking place there. That's kind of right at the interface of where the uh, downdraft and the updraft are right next to each other. Now, just because you're seeing a wall cloud, doesn't mean you're going to see a tornado form. In fact, I would say probably at least in 80% of the cases, yeah. uh, when a wall cloud forms, no tornado develops. It's what you have to watch for is uh, if that wall cloud starts to rotate, especially if it's rotating rapidly, or if you see small cloud fragments rising rapidly up upward into the wall cloud, now you've got a different animal. Now you've got a wall cloud that is really trying to rotate and you, you that's a sure sign that your chances of a tornado developing have have risen pretty significantly yeah um just a quick mention a lot of folks saying my internet goes out i can't watch you guys on tv my phone's not working we want you to have more than one way to get severe weather alerts and uh weather radio is the best way to do that because i know everyone's using their phones but sometimes uh, that's just not the case, and you're not going to be able to have that around. Yeah, you can pick up a NOAA weather radio at a lot of electronic stores, um, uh, with, you know, Radio Shack. I think Walmart carries them. I don't think Radio Shack's around anymore. There's a, <laughs> there, there used to be a couple Radio Shacks. There's still, Dan's aging himself. There's still folks. a couple. There's still a couple, I think. But there's a couple? You can pick one up for like 25 or 30 bucks, yeah. and, and you can program it to go off for your individual county um, and believe me when that thing sounds it, it'll wake you out of a deep sleep it is loud you put that by your bedside you make sure that it's not only plugged into the wall but it's also got the batteries in it in case you lose power it maintains power um, and that thing will, will, will go off for, for you know either a severe thunderstorm warning or a tornado warning or a flash flood warning um, those are really handy uh, especially when we expect severe weather to strike while you're sleeping and, and we do get some of those we what we call those nocturnal events especially towards the tail end of severe weather season june, late may into the first couple of weeks of june those big thunderstorm complexes develop up in eastern kansas the high plains of western oklahoma the texas panhandle and they they take several hours 
But finally, when they reach us here in North Texas, it's usually well after midnight uh, when we get those. Yeah, uh, this is a great picture of Mamatis, and mm -hmm. I love getting these from viewers. You know, if you see clouds like this, it typically means there's a whole lot going on in the atmosphere, a lot of wind, a lot of movement, and they often can be a precursor of some pretty gnarly storms. Yeah, a lot of turbulence. You certainly want to want, want to be flying through, you know, skies no. with 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 those type of clouds. Uh, but those are beautiful clouds that we often see either before or after um, uh, severe weather events. All right, here's one that we've got to discuss. Uh, um, what is the cap? You probably hear us talk about this all the time. The cap is a layer of warm, stable air. Here in North Texas, it's often found up around 5,000 feet on average. It forms because winds, usually around 5,000 feet, are blowing out of the southwest. So if you think about it, if you go several hundred miles southwest of here, it leads to Mexico, a very hot, dry, uh, arid place. Um, and these, these, these winds carry very hot, dry air from the Mexican plateau up around four to 5,000 feet, and they carry it northeastward all the way up into North Texas. And so that forms what we call a cap. So Air on a, on a typical day here, once the temperatures start to heat up, we've got moisture, humidity in the air, it, it rises, uh, but it, as it hits that warm air aloft, it loses its buoyancy. And so typically what you'll see are these kind of these flat looking, you know, cumulus clouds. They don't, they don't exhibit any vertical uh, extent to them, no vertical growth. On a day like that, that means, at least at that point in time, that the cap is holding pretty strong. Now, we like what, that. <laughs> what, yeah, we do. That keeps us quiet. What, what enables us to break through that cap? Well, you need an additional source of lift, it, either extra heating, so we really got to superheat things up, or um, you can get extra lift from a cold front, an approaching cold front, or an upper air disturbance. If you get that boost of lift, that can enable these rising parcels of air to break through the cap. And once they do, there's a tremendous amount of energy that's available for these uh, these uh, rising air parcels to tap into. And I've seen days where you're capped, you're capped, you're capped until, you know, five o'clock, sometimes six o'clock. And then all of a sudden you break through that cap and literally within 15 or 20 minutes, you can have a severe thunderstorm develop. Um, that's all oftentimes a make or break for us here is yes. that cap. If it holds, we don't see severe weather. If it breaks, then we can we can have several storms develop and, and, and really wreak havoc. Now, what is great is that our National Weather okay. Service is based in Fort Worth, and they send up balloons throughout the day to collect data on the atmosphere and whether or not we have that cap in place. So they can often you know change their outlook as the day goes on depending on what that data shows it's so important to have that data the more data we have the better the forecasting is going to be uh, when it comes to the cap and how long it's going to stick around uh, we had a whole lot of this stuff today hail this morning from those thunderstorms most of it was the smaller size that's pretty more common uh, but tomorrow with this forecast we're going to be in that rare size most likely at least for a couple of these storms yeah what i like to tell people is pretty much the bigger the hail the better the storm mm -hmm. so what goes up, you know, must come back down. So the larger the hail size that you have, the stronger the updrafts are required to keep those heavy chunks of ice suspended in the air. Now, eventually, they get out of those updrafts um, and they fall down to the to, to the earth. So you know that if you've got golf ball sized hail, hen egg sized hail, to, that is a very very strong updraft in that uh, severe thunderstorm that's keeping that hail uh, suspended aloft. And, and boy, once it falls, also the, the, the larger these hailstones, the faster what we call their terminal velocity. That's the speed at which they hit the ground. And a softball-sized hail has a terminal velocity of about 100 miles an hour. So whatever it's hitting, being a car windshield or your roof or a window of your home, uh, think about that. Think about, uh, you know, a uh, Major League Baseball pitcher throwing, uh, you know, a, a chunk of ice, a baseball or a softball at 100 miles an hour. It's got a tremendous amount of force 
uh, with it, and it can do a lot of damage. Yeah. We've seen the Wiley Hailstorm. Well, I was going to say, folks that are on our Facebook now from Wiley, I yeah. can guarantee you they remember that one. And that that literally went right through the roofs of homes, uh, and in some cases it penetrated uh, multiple, uh, not only the roof, but uh, through the walls and floors. Um, it's just a tremendous amount of power associated with those very large chunks of ice. Yeah, so obviously severe storms can cause a lot of issues for us. They have in the past, but I think what a lot of people don't realize is in terms of different types of weather phenomena that we deal with here, that people deal with across the world, flooding is the number one killer. It's the number one weather-related killer here in Texas just about every year. And the, the, the sad thing is many of these fatalities are totally avoidable. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're creatures of habit. You know, we go from one place to another, from point A to point B. We take the same route every single day, no matter what's going on. Even if that road is flooded on our route, we don't want to be inconvenienced. We don't want to go out of our way 10 or 15 minutes. Well, turn around, don't drown. There's a reason the National Weather Service started that campaign about 10 years ago is because way too many people were taking chances. And folks, it is just not worth it because if the if the roadway is flooded, it's impossible for you to know how deep that water is. Um, and if you've ever been to the beach uh, and you've stood right as the, the tide is coming in and out, you know the pull that that water has, just a few inches of water. For every foot of water, uh, one foot of water displaces 1,500 pounds. So, you know, if it's fast moving 12 inches of water, that may be enough to carry away a small car. Certainly two feet of, of swift moving water is more than likely going to be enough to carry uh, most passenger cars off yeah. of, of the roadway. And boy, once that happens... It is a very, yeah. very scary situation. I, I've seen so many videos of SUVs and pickups trying to get through high water. You really honestly don't know how deep the water is often, uh, and they've also been picked up. So just because you have a truck doesn't mean you're going to be safe in a lot of these situations. And just be, Yeah, and just because you see a truck go through safely doesn't yeah. mean you can follow that you know vehicle behind it all. I can get through it as well. And it's just, believe me, you know, Take a detour, even if it means going 15 or 20 minutes out of your way, arrive safely and, and, and just don't take a chance. Talk about lightning a little bit here. Um, lightning is, is hotter, five times hotter than the surface of the sun. It can reach temperatures of up to 50,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's no wonder that lightning strikes often result in triggering fires. Yep, and we are well aware of that when we go through our drought periods. You know, our western counties are still in a drought, so even after the system moves through, on days where it's very dry here and the winds pick up, the fire threat goes up, uh, you also hear when thunder roars go indoors, because if you can hear that thunder, you are close enough to be struck by lightning. Now, not all the time will the actual person be struck, but something near you could get hit and you could feel those impacts as well. Yeah, I hate that old adage where, you know, you listen for the thunder and then you count to, you know, whether yeah. it's five or 10, oh, if I can count to 10, that means the storm is two miles away because it takes sound five seconds to travel one mile. The <laughs> fact that you're hearing thunder means you are close enough to be a target to for a lightning strike, mm -hmm. get inside. You want to count once you're inside, that's fine, but don't yeah. don't base you, the decision-making process on whether or not you're close enough to the storm by how close you are to the actual, you know, lightning strike, potential lightning strike as well. If you can hear thunder, you know, as what does they say? When thunder, thunder roars, roars go indoors. Go indoors. Um, this, I'm not surprised by, this is actual statistical information we got from uh, NOAA. Obviously, people outside typically doing leisurely things like fishing or at the beach, boating, that's when we can often have a lot of lightning fatalities. Uh, and that's another reason why before you are planning activities outside, you have to get the weather forecast and kind of know what's going on. And because we have 
weather radios and our cell phones to tell us uh, what's happening and what rate what the radar looks like it's just about knowing before you head out and having a, a plan in place this i'm not surprised by yeah this is a little <laughs> sobering uh, for, for most men the victims by gender 80 percent of lightning fatalities in that 2006 to 2018 time frame were men and only 20% uh, were women. Uh, we'll let you uh, deduce. Mm. Uh, yeah, for, for, Not for surprised <laughs> women live longer than men. Um, someone actually did have a good question. <clears throat> what happened if you're on, on an area lake? So that has actually happened to several people I know where they weren't paying attention to the weather forecast that day. And all of a sudden, the skies are dark close to them, but they don't do anything about it. They don't get off the lake. And then they're stuck in a really nasty thunderstorm. And, you know, boats capsize on our lakes uh, when we have some strong storms it's, in it's just it's it that's a one of those you know what happens if i'm out on the road and there's absolutely nothing around me again it comes to advanced planning if you know there are thunderstorms in the forecast for that particular day you know they just don't come out of nowhere yeah you know thunderstorms just don't magically appear you can start to see clouds building in that afternoon heat and humidity, that's the point in time where you need to start heading heading for shore and getting off the water because there's really no more vulnerable place, uh, you know, than to be out in a lake. Because guess what? You are the tallest object around, you know, out on that lake surface there. And lightning oftentimes takes the shortest path from cloud to ground. And you're going to be a prime target for a lightning strike out in a boat. So, again, it all comes to advanced planning. Um, you know, if there's severe weather in the forecast tomorrow, not a good idea uh, to schedule a long trip, you know, yeah. uh, you know, two or three hour trip. Same goes for for, you know, when we expect weather, we expect this line of storms to be pushing uh, through the Metroplex, maybe during rush hour. So if you're at work at that time, don't get in your car and try to beat the line of storms home. Stay at the office. Let the storms ride through mm -hmm. um, and then head home. Yeah, it's going to mean you, you may miss dinner. You may be a couple hours late um, or you leave the office, you know, well ahead of, of the actual storms themselves moving through. Yeah. And when you are driving, we see this all the time and we say it on air. Do not stop underneath overpasses. When there's large hail, you see all those cars just blocking the road, basically. And then everyone behind them is stuck getting pelted yeah. with very large hail. And if there is a tornado warning and there's a tornado and sitting under an overpass is the last place you want to be. Yeah, because wind it tends to accelerate, uh, you know, through those those narrow openings like that. And you can actually expose yourself to even higher wind gusts. Um, in, in a situation, you know, like that. And needless to say, too, you know, when people start clogging uh, the uh, underneath the overpasses like that, they back up traffic for miles and then they put the people behind them really in, in harm's way. And we've seen that, unfortunately, happen many, many times, many instances over the years. Yeah. Um, there is, once we are finished here answering questions, this is going to be pinned at the top of our weather page our, on Facebook. So if you have someone that you want to see this, uh, a lot of folks have storm anxiety or the thing their kids do. Uh, this is going to be on our Facebook page and we'll likely have it in a few other areas as well. It should be very easily available here uh, for the foreseeable future. Yeah, so, so you know, yeah. if it, it'll be there and then maybe tomorrow, you know, if there's teachers at schools that 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 want to, you know, maybe show these to their students, uh, they can they can watch the video yeah. that's posted to it our is, Fox 4 weather page. And we uh, do also have plans in, in schools as well. They do drills several absolutely. times a year. Yeah, yeah. And the kids, you know, I've been to so many schools over the years and, and you'd be amazed at what those second and third and fourth mm -hmm. graders, they know, you know, what to do they typically and where know to more go. than their parents so if you don't know like ask your kids they, they probably yeah. do know uh yeah. what to do and where to go Wait, a lot of people asking about weather radios so that's great yeah let's pick one up this is what we're talking about right here um this is a NOAA weather radio um and this is the uh the antenna uh on that uh, NOAA weather radio you notice it plugs right into the wall um in the back here is the uh, slot for the uh the batteries so this is a good one it's got battery backup um, and you can test it out. Um, it's not plugged in right now, but if I were to hit that test button, you would hear that yeah. piercing loud um, noise that, that comes from this thing uh, to, to wake you up. Uh, but usually um, they'll, they'll be pretty generic, 
you know, they'll, they'll go off and they'll tell you where the storm is located, um, what it's doing, is it, is it large hail or damaging wind gusts, what direction it's, it's moving in. So you certainly get the basic information mm -hmm. here uh, from our, our weather radios. And um, basically, it, it's kind of the same thing as outdoor warning sirens. That's another it's one. Not, it's not an end-all, be-all. I mean, that's mm -hmm. basically saying, hey, something's going on. It's alerting you find out more information yeah um and so yeah that's a good good opportunity to tell people more outdoor warning sirens are just that they are outdoors they're not meant to wake you out of bed if you're close enough if you live close enough to one and it does that that's a bonus or, or, or maybe it's not yeah. if, if you don't want to be interrupted at all um but I, I interviewed a number of people after the North Dallas tornado, October 2019, in that St. Mark's neighborhood mm -hmm. there in North Dallas. I was told the same story time and time again. We're watching the football game, the Cowboys game on TV. We're huddled in our living room. We're on our sofa. We hear the warning sirens go off. They go off for a couple minutes. They stopped. We look outside. Nothing's going on. We, we didn't get an alert on our phone at that point in time, so we figured the threat's over. That's not the case. Those warning sirens, when they sound, they don't sound for the entire duration of the warning. They sound for a couple of minutes and then they typically go off. Um, and so what they told me is that uh, it was quiet for a couple of minutes yeah. after the siren stopped. And it was eerie. It was, it was very quiet. eerily silent. And then all of a sudden they lost power. Mm -hmm. And then within seconds um, after losing power, the wind went from zero to 150 in a matter of seconds. And they're literally sitting in their living rooms on their sofas and the roof is starting to peel away and walls are starting to come in and windows are starting to, to, to break in. And they're literally running for their lives in their homes, screaming for their kids who are upstairs um, to get downstairs and, and running for the actual hallway closets or, or bathroom to take yeah. shelter. And, um, and severe weather was in the forecast that day. It was. We were both on we were, the air. We were the on air during time. that situation. So a lot of folks, you know, some people that weren't as interested in watching football while their significant other was, they were literally on their phone looking at the WAP and watching us on air. So some of them were able to actually tell everyone in their home, we need to get to our safe shelter right now because this thing is on the ground and it's heading right for us. Yeah. And it's... You know, one of the things I'd also say, too, is that our warning system is not perfect. Um, you're going to get false alarms. There are going to be tornado warnings issued by the National Weather Service that don't result in, in tornadoes. Why is that? Well, the, the, the National Weather Service watches Doppler radar for rotation. If they're showing signs of strong rotation um, through several successive scans of their radar, they will go ahead and hit the trigger oftentimes and issue a tornado warning. Even though at that point in time, they don't have 100% evidence that a tornado is on the ground. It, you can't wait sometimes. You can't yeah. wait for a tornado to touch down to issue a warning. At that point, it's too late. Because time, yeah. time means everything. If you have a couple minutes advance warning, you can do a lot in, in just a couple of minutes. And, and it, it literally saves lives. Obviously, the, the flip side of that is you are going to have some false warnings. And some people, you know, every time we talk about severe weather, you know, they think, oh, we didn't get it. You know, here you go again. Well, again, these are high impact, low probability events. So even on a day like tomorrow, the vast majority of people are not going to see those destructive winds, the destructive hail, the tornadoes where they live. But there is a very, very good chance that we have communities mm -hmm. tomorrow that are going to be impacted. And again, we are not at the stage, the understanding of the science uh, of meteorology to tell you which communities those are. We just know that we're all kind of in the same boat tomorrow. Conditions are going to be favorable. They're going to be ripe for the de yeah. development of, of pretty powerful storms. They're going to move uh, eastward across the area. And there are going to be, uh, you know, places that get hit pretty hard tomorrow. I think what's great about tomorrow in, is that with that squall line, as it's approaching our western counties, we will be on air. And all you have to do is look at the radar and see, okay, here's the line. Look at all of those warnings already 100 miles west of me. 
this thing, it's not going to weaken. We don't expect this one to weaken. Uh, Sunday night, I expected that line of showers and storms to weaken as it moved through, and it did. We don't expect that tomorrow. So once that line approaches our western counties, we can pretty much guarantee there will be some type of strong to severe weather along that line. Now, what's harder is that this isolated potential supercell that we could see from noon to about three. Yeah, those those are the ones that sometimes you, you really have to be on your toes and on your yeah. guard for those. And, and yeah. that's going to be like kind of the noon to three o'clock, four o'clock And they'll be time moving frame. very quickly. And they could be moving 40, 50, maybe mm -hmm. 60 miles an hour from, from south to north across the area. Those isolated potential supercells that develop during the early to mid afternoon hours. And those are the ones we'll have to keep a close eye on. Yeah. So certainly tomorrow's a day you want to be weather aware literally all day and, and, and through the evening. Make sure you've got the WAP downloaded on your phone so that you can watch and, and monitor live radar. And obviously, bonus, if you can watch us live on the air too, we'll, we'll be live on the air and, and more than likely uh, we'll be yeah. trying to cover things on social and media as well. if we are, which I have a feeling at some point, what we like to call wall to wall. So it's just going to be us talking about these tornado warnings. If there is a tornado warning issued, we will be on air, no breaks. So when that takes place, that is not just on air, but it's live streamed on our website, on all of the apps, and it will also be on Facebook as well. So there are multiple ways that you'll be able to see us uh, doing what we do here and tracking the storms for you tomorrow once a uh, tornado warning is issued. Now, we're, we don't necessarily stay in that wall-to-wall -wall coverage if there are no warnings. Um, and if there are severe thunderstorm warnings, it really depends on how intense those storms are. But either way, you're going to have more than one way to get the information tomorrow, for sure. Yeah, and one of the things that we have an advantage of as well is probably about 10 years ago, the uh, National Weather Service started what was called a chat session. And we all, yeah. all in the media, the uh, meteorologists uh, have access to this uh, this chat session, and it's it's one chat group, and it's it's kind of a you know one room that's that's fed with all kind of information, reports from emergency managers, law enforcement, city officials mm -hmm. from all across North Texas, and so we get instantaneous reports of, of what's happening all across the area and then can can basically uh, disseminate that information out over live on the air. And it's really been uh, a godsend for us. Mm -hmm. uh, and not only that, but our I got to give a kudos to our storm chasers uh, who um, are not on the payroll. But uh, boy, they they go out. There are ground truth reports mm -hmm. out there uh, that report weather as it's going on. Um, you know, I, I'd start naming names, but I feel like I would, I would leave out we a name too many. or two. Yeah, we've got too There's many names. so many that, that help us and, and boy, they, they do a tremendous job, uh, and, and they, they really perform, mm -hmm. uh, you know, or, you know, take place, uh, you know, a, a very important part of our coverage. Can you uh, talk about a PDS watch and someone else asked, could we be in a high risk tomorrow? I, at this point, I really don't think it matters whether we're in moderate or high. Uh, because we still expect severe weather to develop. Do you think? I mean, I think the potential might be there for, for one of these uh, PDS watches. That's a particularly dangerous situation. They tag that on the actual watch itself. Um, mm -hmm. we, we could potentially see one issued uh, for, you know, let's say, especially our eastern, eastern counties, counties um, at some points, uh, you know, in the, uh, in the afternoon hours. That's totally determined by kind of a joint collaboration between the National Weather Service Forecast Office in Fort Worth and the Storm Prediction Center in Norman. And, and you know, they'll often, you know, wait until tomorrow, till all the morning data, the Is morning that? soundings come in. They look at the situation again, uh, and then they'll determine whether or not maybe they want to, you know, highlight that watch you know, with that verbiage to uh, to try to get people's attention. But, you know, even if there's not one that's issued, um, it, it still has the potential to be, you know, certainly a very significant day for us uh, tomorrow with the uh, threat of, of large hail, damaging winds and tornadoes. And even when that squall line moves through, um, while the, the main threat with that line will be damaging winds followed by hail, there likely still will be spin up tornadoes mm -hmm. along the leading edge of sure. that line of tornadoes. And would not surprise me at all if we get several tornado warnings out of the line of storms as it moves yeah. east across the area. Uh, Randall wants to talk about signing up for text messages from your city you're living in. Uh, I believe you'd have to go to the city's website. Yeah. And there are links on. Uh, 
all the, on most of them. I haven't, I live in Dallas County. I'm in East Dallas. So I, it was very easy to go through and, and see that information there. Um, but it really depends on how well your city manages their website and how easy it is to find. Yeah. And your phone should automatically get stuff as well. It should, too. Um, generally. Make sure you go in those settings and, and that you haven't checked it off. But uh, just like Amber Alerts, you know, your phone should get weather alerts automatically on it uh, as well. Most yeah. cell phone carriers, I think that's a requirement that, at this that, point yeah. that, that, that you get those on your phone, um, you know, for most carriers, uh, you know, where you live. Yeah. Uh, someone asked, will DFW get a tornado watch tomorrow? Yeah. I'm just going to say it. there's a very high likelihood we have a tornado watch. Uh, you know, we've been under tornado watches and never had a tornado, but we've had a whole bunch of severe storms with large hail and winds. So either way, there's a good chance if, which most of our counties, if not all of them will be in a watch at some point tomorrow. So just to know that whether it's a thunderstorm watch, tornado watch, uh, severe weather potential is going to be out there. And as Dan mentioned earlier, you know, with our wall clouds, 80% of severe storms typically don't produce tornadoes. Uh, the tornado threat, when you think about it compared to our damaging wind and hail threat is lower. There's a greater chance we could have winds 70, 75 miles an hour tomorrow. That's a weak tornado. So that's going to cause just as much damage as a potential tornado. Yeah, wind, as, as my friend, Tim Marshall, who's a well-known meteorologist and, and wind engineer says, wind is wind. Yeah. It, you know, whether if sure. it's blowing at 75 miles an hour, it doesn't matter if it's, if it's caused by a tornado or straight line winds it still has the potential to do a great deal of, of damage. And that's certainly nothing to, uh, to take lightly, even if we're getting, you know, warnings for just high wind uh, and, and large hail. We've, we've seen them do plenty of damage, uh, you know, over the years here in North Texas. Yeah, this is a great one. So the tornadoes can spin up along the line. So would the stronger tornado threat be more with the supercells versus the line? That's a good question. Yeah, th it would. I mean, it, you know, supercells, especially those those isolated, what we call those discrete storms, um, where they're not having to compete uh, mm -hmm. for moisture with, with storms along the line itself, have the potential to be stronger uh, just because, you know, they've, they've got more of the available energy, you know, to, to, to work with. Um, and they tend to be very, very well-organized, long sustained thunderstorms um, and sometimes they can produce what, what are called long track tornadoes as well that can track several miles sometimes tens of miles on the ground over the course of, of an hour or longer sometimes yeah. we hope we hope we don't see that tomorrow um, but there's a possibility to get a yeah. couple of strong tornadoes in a setup like yeah. tomorrow especially if we see some of those big supercells develop ahead of the line itself uh, Evelyn lives on the second floor of her apartment. Uh, downstairs, there's no interior place for her to go. Bathroom or closet. That's your best bet. Stay away from windows. As Dan mentioned earlier, you want just as, as many walls between you and the outside of your home as possible. So even on the second floor, uh, bathrooms have plumbing. So that's a great, I mean, that is absolutely great if you can be in an interior bathroom. If not, closet would be a, a really good you know, one. I, well. And I, I talked to a friend, you know, um, if, if, if you're savvy, if, if you know how to use a hammer and, and, you know, or if you know a good handyman, you can actually reinforce a closet, you know, mm -hmm. let's say in your home with a few sheets of plywood um, put up on the, uh, on the interior of that closet itself, um, screwed into the actual, you know, studs in your home. You can make your own safe room in your home without having to invest you know, thousands of dollars in a tornado shelter. You can make that interior closet or your interior safe room even more safe mm -hmm. um, with an investment of, of maybe, you know, lumber is, is more expensive nowadays, but I would still imagine for a couple hundred dollars, um, you could do yourself a favor and, and, and make something even more fortified within your home itself. Yeah. Um, under your staircase, if you have a closet under the stairwell, that's another decent place that you, if that is your most interior place in your home, I think that's also uh, pretty good. Yeah. One thing I would say is, you know, every home is different Yeah. And, and built differently. If you've got a choice between two interior rooms, you might ask yourself, what's, what's above me right here? Is the chimney right above this particular room? If it is, 
then use the other room because in high winds, sometimes those chimneys collapse mm -hmm. and that's a tremendous amount of weight, you know, coming down. Um, and then you want to, you want to be in that interior room that that's what maybe there's a, a heavy pool table, you know, above your head. Uh, you know, then you want to think about, you know, the, the room that's a little farther away, a little bit more displaced uh, from something that may collapse down um, in that type of situation. Yeah. So it's hard, it's hard for us to tell you, you know, exactly, you know, where to go. You know your home, you know the floor plan, you know, better mm -hmm. than anyone. Um, and, but those are some of the other things that, that you can think about too. If you've got choices, maybe there's only one choice. In that case, the, you yeah. know, it's, it's an easy decision to make, but if there's a choice between a couple of rooms, those are the other factors yeah. that you need to think yeah. about. It's all about preparedness. So our whole goal with this, talking to you all tonight, is so that you, you know, kind of get the brain work and start thinking about these things. Uh, obviously, we didn't we didn't plan today as the day to do this because we knew severe weather was going to happen tomorrow. It just so happened that 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 is what's happening. But having all of your plan in place, knowing where you're going in your home or if you're leaving your home, having an emergency kit, a first aid kit, having everything set up in your sheltered area in your home already takes so much anxiety and worry out of the picture because we want you to be able to react extremely fast in these types of situations. So not having to worry about that other stuff should at least a little bit get rid of some of the yeah. storm anxiety. I know a lot of folks still talking about it's just like a test. Anxiety. You know, when you when you when you've we studied you study long for hours it. for the test, and when you've when you've prepared, you're going to feel a lot better about yeah. it going into it. If you haven't studied at all, and if you've been skipping classes, you're going to get pretty problem. anxious about it. You know, and our goal when we're on air talking to you about these storms, tracking everything for you, we want to be that cool, calm, collected professor letting you know, okay, this is what's going on uh, and uh, just explaining to you what's happening. So knowing what's going on may also help lower your anxiety a little, a little bit as well. So that's really our goal is getting you prepared for situations like this and taking you through it. So we're talking about before a storm, during a storm, and then after as well. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, that's, don't discount that either. I mean, you know, sometimes people are anxious to get out of their homes uh, after they've been hit by a storm and to immediately survey the damage. Give that time. There, there's a yeah. lot, a lot of times people suffer sometimes even fatal injuries after the storm has hit with down power lines, with things that you cannot see uh, that could cause a peril to you. Just even simple things like I learned the hard way about stepping on a dirty nail uh, yes. several months ago, and I got a very, very bad infection that that almost required me to lose my foot. Um, yeah. And and it's believe me, it's there's there's a lot that can happen mm -hmm. after a storm hits as well. Um, and you know you you want to be prepared not only for what's you know coming ahead of the storm, but but after the storm as well, knowing yeah. that there's a, a lot of potential pitfalls out there that you can find yourself in trouble in. Uh, so someone at Doc Peter asked about storm chaser seminars like last year in Arlington. So, uh, but also there are uh, Skywarn uh, seminars that the National Weather Service puts together and they start those in January. And there was actually one supposed to be <laughs> happening. Bless you. There was actually one that was supposed to be happening tomorrow in Ellis County, but they canceled it. They have to reschedule it. So if anyone in Ellis County was actually heading to that and you didn't know, because of the severe weather, the folks at the weather service, they're going to be busy tomorrow, just like us. So uh, they're going to reschedule that one. So if yeah, you go I to their the website, ones, they'll they'll tell you where, you know, when, whatever they have left. I think Dallas, Tarrant, Collin, and Denton County have all, have all, all happened. They've all happened already. Yeah. Um, so, um, but, uh, you know, there are, there are also good information, good sources of information that you can find on YouTube. YouTube, yeah. The National Weather Service uh, does. Um and, and obviously the, the, the video that uh, we're doing here tonight or the live that we're doing uh, will be posted and you can kind of go back mm -hmm. or tell friends or family about it and they can, they can you know, tune in as well. What time are we at right now? Uh, it's almost eight o'clock, so, uh, but there is one question at, that I wanted to answer because I, this actually happened to Evan and I, uh, if you remember the day after Christmas tornadoes mm -hmm. 2015, what happens if the tornado warning is coming right for us here at the station? What do we do? Who takes over? We will continue to broadcast as 
as long as we can. We do have a backup generator. Uh, our goal is to send all of our staff downstairs into our basement. We have a basement here in our building in downtown Dallas. Uh, and uh, this is a pretty sturdy building. There are no windows. So we've got lots of, we don't see what's going on outside. We only have the radar here. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we would be on air as long as it's safe for us to do so. And even then we would likely still leave up radar and try to talk over it as much as possible. Yeah, it's yeah. a it's a fortress here. There's no it's, question about there's it. There's no getting in and no getting out. Uh, yes. <laughs> but fortunately we've we've yeah, you know, well there've been a couple situations, like you said, the day after, you know, uh Christmas that was uh, mm -hmm. that was just a sad, heart wrenching situation there, uh where we had a storm literally coming right for downtown Dallas, and, and that one weekend, and then a new storm formed and in that's its the, eastern the flight. Garland, Rowlett. And that's the one that produced yeah. the tornado in Seagoville, and then Garland and Rowlett, and went mm -hmm. on north from there. Um, but uh, yeah, we've, you know, we'll we'll be on the air if at all possible. Yeah, um, if an area doesn't have sirens, not everyone has outdoor warning sirens, and that's another thing. They're called outdoor warning sirens, not tornado sirens. So some cities will warn for damaging winds in excess of 70 miles an hour. Yeah, the criteria are hail. different from city yeah. to city, but the minimum criteria that the majority have adopted now is 70 mile an hour wind gusts. Um, I, I believe hail that's the size of half dollars or larger, and then obviously tornadoes. Yeah. So just because you're hearing those outdoor warning sirens doesn't necessarily mean there's a tornado warning for your area. It could mean very high winds uh, or large hail. large hail. And if your area doesn't have the sirens, that's why we want you to have more than one way to receive alerts, whether it's through an app or something on your phone, but also the weather radio option. Uh, there are so many different ways to, re to get severe weather information now compared to a decade ago. Yeah. I remember when it was just the, literally, if you had a siren or your weather radio and that was it. Yeah, and the more the more ways that you have, uh, the better, yeah. and that's for sure. And that's something else that you you know should be kind of thinking yeah. about right now is that if I didn't have my phone, you know, uh, with me, how would I get you know alerted to severe mm -hmm. weather going on? And of course, we talked about the NOAA weather radio, very very, you know, inexpensive investment to make. It's twenty five or thirty bucks. That's it. You can. That's you a can, part of your severe preparedness kit, yeah. your plan uh, that can be used all year round. Again, this once this live stream is over, which we're going to probably wrap it up now, uh, we, this will be on our weather page. We'll pin it at the top, share it, have other folks look at it, have your kids watch it, uh, and just be prepared throughout the season. We're going to do our best to do that for you. Uh, the closer we get to an event, the better we can forecast it. We all know that accuracy goes way up, and that's going to be another thing tomorrow morning. When the morning data comes in, uh, Kylie's going to be on Good Day, and she'll be updating you with that information, and Dan and I will be here through the day. That's right. So stay safe, uh, stay weather alert, and uh, stay with us here at Box 4. Uh, we'll keep you uh, uh, you know, abreast of the situation, yeah. not only online, but on social media, and of course, on the air as uh, well. So make sure that you're Tune in uh, yep. in some form or fashion tomorrow throughout the afternoon and the evening hours. Thank you very much for joining us Great here questions. tonight. Great questions. If I Great miss questions. anything, we'll try and go back. Yeah. And you're more than welcome to ask us on the weather page. You can ask on our personal pages as well. Uh, Twitter It's another place where we try to answer as many questions as possible. You can email me. I actually prefer email and mm -hmm. answering because you can really write a novel. Sometimes I like to do that. So, uh, so we appreciate you all. Thank you so much for staying with us. Have a great night. Take care.